Welcome to Chasm Workspaces. In this video, we will provide an overview of platform administration and walk you through a basic setup of some of the most configured features. We will be focused on setting up your Workspaces deployment to support remote work for a software developer. This video assumes you have Workspaces running and ready to configure. For information on the installation of Workspaces, see our installation documentation and video. If your browser is warning you that your connection to the server is insecure, this is because the default installation utilizes a self-signed SSL certificate. For guidance on configuring a valid certificate signed by a public certificate authority, refer to the Replacing Self-Signed Certificates page in our documentation or our certificates video. Alternatively, workspaces can be installed behind Cloudflare tunnels as shown in other YouTube videos. The installation automatically creates one admin and one normal user account. Let's change the password on the admin account if you didn't already do so during the installation. Then we can delete the default user and create a user account for our remote developer. We now have our developer account set up. Now let's look at groups. All users are automatically assigned to all users group, which has a priority of 1000. When group settings overlap, the group with the lowest priority takes precedence. User-defined groups will have a lower priority value than all users group. The all users group should therefore be used to define baseline configurations that should apply to all users. To ensure a secure and seamless experience for all Chasm users, we recommend implementing several session time limit settings. Firstly, enable two-factor authentication, which will prompt users to set up an additional layer of security using TOTP compatible apps such as Microsoft Authenticator or Google Authenticator. Next, I will add settings specific to developers, such as allowing audio in and out, allowing clipboard up and down, and allowing uploads and downloads. To ensure that inactive sessions do not take up unnecessary resources, we suggest setting an idle session timeout of 30 minutes by default in the All Users group. This will automatically log out users who are inactive for this duration and disconnect any connected sessions. The Keep Alive expiration is the number of seconds a session can remain unused before it will be deleted. We don't want sessions to remain indefinitely as they consume resources. The minimum value needs to be at least twice the Keep Alive interval setting, which is 300 seconds by default. I went with a value of 3600 seconds or one hour. This means that user sessions will be automatically deleted if unused for an hour. You should adjust to meet your own requirements. Next, I will set the maximum number of sessions a user can have open concurrently. I will allow persistent profiles. In order to work, persistent profiles must also be configured in the workspace settings. Session sharing allows users to put their session into sharing mode, allowing other users to join and view their session. Lastly, the usage limit setting can be used to set a maximum usage number of hours for users or groups over the set time period but is not enabled by default and should be used for metered workspace access. Workspaces automatically generates SSH keys for each user and allows the user to upload their own if they wish to override the default keys. By enabling SSH key injection, each user's SSH key is placed in the session so that they can be used for accessing remote systems. This is the most useful when using Workspaces as a secure bastion host to administer remote systems. We will disable downloads, which does not allow users to download files from the remote workspace session, but will allow uploads from the user's local system to the remote workspace session. Finally, let's look at the workspaces section inside the group policy. You will notice all images that have been downloaded via the registry. Here, we recommend removing all images from all users group so specific images may be added to certain groups. Now we'll create a developer group for this specific use case. Here's the first thing required to add the users into this group. Here, we will add the developer user to this group. Moving on to the Workspaces panel, you will see the images that you selected from the Workspaces registry. We will clone the Ubuntu desktop and provide the development department with a new desktop. For this demonstration, they will use the same Docker image. However, you may want to build custom images. See our other videos and documentation on creating and managing custom images. To create an organizational share for each group of users and set up storage for persistent profiles, I've SSH to the server where Workspaces is installed. For this demonstration, I'm creating local folders on the file system, but you should use a centralized file system 
such as AWS EFS, NFS, SMB, Hadoop file system, or any centralized file system that can be mounted to the desired workspaces agents. I'll create a folder for data shares and development, which is the name of the group we made. Also, I've created a directory for user profiles. Workspaces uses user ID 1000 on the host for users inside containers. So the folder created must be owned by UID 1000. Workspaces controls which shares users have access to based on group membership. On the Workspace panel, I'm going to define volume mappings for the organizational shares. The first field is the location on the host followed by the target location inside the Workspaces container. The mode defines read-only or read-write access. UID and GID should be set to 1000. Finally, the required field tells Workspaces to fail a session creation if the share is inaccessible. Workspaces checks that each volume being mapped is accessible before attempting to create the container. If the target location is not accessible and the volume mapping is marked as not required, the container will be created without the volume mapping. Next, we will define persistent profile settings on the image. Each image should have a unique location in the persistent profile path. Note the username tag, which will be replaced by the username for each respective user. Let's have a look at some of the other image settings. CPU, cores, RAM, and GPU settings allow you to set the resource constraints. A centralized Docker registry can be used. Chasm Manage Images are in Docker Hub. As you can see, the registry setting Workspaces constantly checks for updates in the registry and downloads new versions of the image when it is available. Let's rename the Chrome image used for browser isolation to Secure Internet Access. The next panel we will configure is the Web Filter Policy. When users access the internet from inside Chasm Workspaces, it will apply this policy, which can consist of a whitelist, blacklist, or URL categorization. URL categorization is not available on the Community Edition. However, whitelisting and blacklisting are available. For this demonstration, we will add Amazon and eBay to the list of websites to block. Web filter policies can be applied to a group or directly to images. Our installation is mostly configured, but before we take it for a test drive, let's quickly run through the other panels to learn a little bit about their functionality. Zones can be used for large deployments by virtually splitting the infrastructure for different purposes. For example, zones can be used for security to more easily describe resources and ensure only authorized users have access to specific zones. Zones can also be used to manage geographic regions. For example, you may want to run a stack in US East and Europe so that you can direct users to the closest region. Docker agents are now located under the Compute tab along with servers and pools. Agents are nodes that provide the end user with streaming containers. Workspaces manage clusters of the agents and can automatically scale them in AWS, OCI, GCP, Azure, and DigitalOcean. Agents can be deployed on physical hardware or virtual machines in your data center or in the cloud. The Agents tab allows you to see available compute resources and adjust their settings. You can use the Edit option to enable and disable agents, which is useful for updating the operating system of the agents. Disabling an agent will not provision any more users to the system, but existing sessions will continue to function. Once all sessions have drained from the system, you can update the system and bring it back online by enabling it. The RAM and CPU override options allow you to tell the platform how much RAM or CPU cores the system has, rather than using the physical RAM or cores. This is useful for tuning and resource allocation calculations. By default, the platform makes one-to-one -one calculation. If an agent has four CPUs and an image is set to two cores, the agent will only be able to provision two instances of that image, no matter how much RAM you have. When you have agents with high core counts, it makes more sense to override the CPU core count, especially if the system has high RAM to CPU ratio. Each deployment is different and the workload of users may vary, so it's a good idea to adjust the CPU override settings over time. The default setting of 1 to 1 is very conservative, so we often suggest starting with a 2 to 1 oversubscription ratio on your cores. RAM override, on the other hand, should be considered with a much greater care. The session casting feature allows you to provide users with a simple URL that will put them directly into a workspace streaming session with or without authentication. Staging allows you to define pre-staged sessions. If you use Chasm Workspaces, you already know it's fast, but configuring staging, you can make Workspaces sessions established almost immediately by pre-allocating containers for sessions. 
The branding feature allows you to set custom branding throughout the platform, including a logo and a background for the login page, a customized splash screen, a customized workspaces launcher background, header logo, and system messages. This feature is only available on the Enterprise tier. The Developer API allows you to directly instrument the Workspaces system without the use of the web app. This provides the ability to create a very customized Workspaces environment. Workspaces provides several authentication mechanisms for single sign-on, or SSO, including SAML, LDAP, OIDC, and Keycloak. Native SAML identity providers include Okta, OneLogin, Azure AD, ADFS, and others. Chasm has built-in logging. All systems in the stack send logs to their respective manager. Chasm can then send those logs to a central logging solution such as Splunk. For smaller deployments, you can rely on the built-in logging mechanism, which utilizes the Postgres database. By default, workspaces are configured with a log retention policy of four hours for debug logs and seven days for all other logs. Now that we've gone over most of the features, let's log in as our remote developer and see their user experience. Since our developer has not set up two-factor authentication, I will need to set that up. Simply take a picture of the barcode with the Google Authenticator app, and it will start displaying a random token every 60 seconds. Now that I have the token set up, I can log in. Our developer only has access to the Ubuntu desktop, VS Code, and the remote browser. Let's create an instance of the desktop and test out some of the features that we configured. Let's open the file manager and test that the organizational shares are working. Now we'll go to Amazon and eBay and see if our web filter is blocking these sites. If we look at the control panel, we'll notice that the downloads button is missing because we have disabled downloads for all users. Even though downloads are disabled, uploading a file to the remote session is still allowed. Next, we will create a favorites link to test persistent profiles. File mapping is yet another major feature to be added to the platform. File mapping allows administrators to define files that will be mapped to the inside of a user's session. These files can be defined at a user level, the group level, and at the workspace level. Files can be text and edited directly in the Chasm admin UI, or they can be arbitrary files that are uploaded. In this quick example, I'm creating a Chrome managed policy that will define bookmarks and Chrome settings. You can see that the managed policy defines a bookmark for chasmweb.com. With the file mapping saved, I'll now create an instance of Chrome inside the desktop workspace. Here you can see that the Chrome managed policies that I defined in the file mapping have been applied. Thank you for joining us in learning about the administration of your workspace's deployment. See our documentation for additional examples and use cases.